Hey, welcome to Minor Details. I'm Nick. And I'm James. And we're two industrial designers in the big city sweating the small stuff. Ooh, yeah. Shout out to Graham for sending that one in. Yes, he uh, he gave us a whole new batch of uh, very inspired uh, taglines. I really, I, I like this one a lot, actually. Sweating the small stuff. I can feel it. Yeah, because we often have to turn off the AC in Nick's room in yeah. order to record, which literally makes us sweat. Yeah. And then we're talking about the small stuff, which would make one perspire even more than normal. Exactly. We're just drenched right now. <laughs> Oh, man. How you been, James? I've been pretty good. But, um, Nick, last night, I was lucky enough to be in attendance at your talk at the Apple Williamsburg store. Yeah, that's right. I did my Apple uh, Today at Apple talk last night, and it was fun. Yes. I'm still reeling from the experience. <laughs> no, it was... I Yeah, I, I think it was a, a good event. We had... What do you think? 40 or 50 people show up? Yeah. Um, I mean, there were hundreds if you count the entire store. Right. That was a kind of interesting part of it. It was, you know, the Williamsburg Apple store, you have all the tables of Apple products in the front of the store. And then the back, you have this big screen that you can present on. Right. And so they select creatives to come in and show off, you know, what they can do with Apple products and talk about what they do as a career. And they selected me to show off some of my chair sketching abilities yeah it it was um the whole setup was kind of reminiscent of like a uh a market place scene you might see in uh in like movies such as aladdin yeah or um the life of brian by monty python you have you have transactions happening but then you have uh sort of high priests mm, right 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 um uh, preaching to to uh, it, to the masses that would huddle around them in the town square, saying, yeah. you know, be gone, evil spirits. <laughs> that was weird. That part of your talk was really <laughs> weird when you brought that person up and put your hand on their forehead. <laughs> um, I, I will say, I am going to upload. I, I live streamed it, so yes. hopefully you got to watch it. But I also will upload it to my Patreon. Nice. Um, but I'll, I'll upload it for free so anyone can watch it. Now, I, I have to ask a question, yeah. some behind-the-scenes stuff. Yeah. Um, first of all, did you have the chair pre-planned? Did you know what you were going to draw before you started drawing? Yes, I had the idea of sketching out a chair that was inspired by the Apple chairs that are already there in the yeah. store. It's like They look like cubes, and then inside the cube, it's hollowed out so you can put a, another cube yeah. So you can have like a wooden cube and a leather cube. And so I, sh I thought I should just riff off of that. One thing was is that it's a short demo. I could only do like a 40-minute sketch. So normal chairs take like an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. And I had to trim it down and make a really simple chair. Yeah. How how nervous were you going into it? I think definitely a bit. Yeah. I uh, I think anyone would get nervous, public speaking. I think everyone does. I, but I will say... It's something that I've certainly practiced. Right. And in school, I did a lot of talks and we pre presented our projects. Um, and especially now that I'm doing more school events and things like that, you know, it's starting to become secondhand. Yeah. So I think, I think um, we do the podcast too. Yeah. I think uh, a lot of people, you know, deal with a certain amount of nervousness when they when they get up to talk about their work in front of people. Well, public speaking is the number one fear. Yeah. Well, this one was kind of weird, too, because it was literally public. We were in the Apple store. <laughs> Everyone's there. Who knows? Who I like to, you know, I was thinking about that whole situation, and I was thinking about the 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 child running around the store who happens to, like, you know see your talk or bits of your talk and see what you're doing up there and become inspired to that, be the next generation of ind industrial designer. I hope that happened. That'd be amazing. Yeah. That'd be so beautiful. I well, also... I actually, I mean, I grabbed the kid and I, and I like forced them. I was like, you will, you will watch this. <laughs> <laughs> no, James, I'm pretty sure you get, get, get didn't sent you to jail see me that. getting dragged out by security. <laughs> that was weird. I actually, I felt like there was a few people that came just to see you, James. Because <laughs> you had posted a story that you were going to go. And you're like, hey, come come to the Apple thing with Nick. I'll be there too. 
I said, and I said, most importantly, Nick will be there. Yeah, I. But after the Apple presentation was over, I walked over to chat with you, and you were ta- talking to a few other designers. And you know, I introduced myself to some of these designers, and and I was like, yeah, thanks for coming, guys. And one of the designers said, oh, I I just got here. I just wanted to talk to James. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> what? No, I don't think he said that. But no. it, it did kind of it. It felt like that in my head. No, yeah, no, there was, no. There was one one guy that was like that. Listen, people were only oh, talking. There was some minor details fans there too. Oh yeah, people were only talking to me because the line to talk to you was so long. <laughs> that's that's how it works. Oh man, we, I'm the sideshow. I'm the other guy. I kind of want to do a poll on the minor details uh, Instagram that says. Who's the better host? Why would you want to run such a depressing poll? It's not a depressing poll. I think it's just a realistic <laughs> hopefully, poll. Hopefully uh, hopefully 50-50 or I'm I'm okay with coming in second, okay? I it's I think Nick you're come in and first. James. Honestly, I think people like you better than me, James. No, I don't think that's possible. I saw square one was was uh was should have been renamed Nick Con. Oh boy. Okay. Well, we we should <laughs> Anyways, the Apple talk was great. I appreciate yeah. you coming. And if you're listening right now, thank you guys for coming. I know we had a few uh, detail, minor details. People came to the Apple talk. Um, so shout out to you guys. Yeah. And I mean, Nick, this was basically a warm up. You're doing another talk. Yeah, I'm doing a talk tomorrow. I guess not when you're listening to this. It'll already have passed. But I'm going to, to do a VR demo at uh, the Pratt Institute. Nice. Just down the street. Nice. I live in I live in the the bedsty, and Pratt <laughs> Pratt's in bedsty too. So yeah. How uh, how'd you get that gig? Um. Oh, funny you ask. You know the pet world, dog toys. Do I know it? <laughs> I actually got connected through the dog toy world. I uh, y- when you design dog toys, you're really connected with other people that design dog toys. <laughs> and so, you know, there's people on Instagram that you know noticed I yeah. designed dog toys for JW. And we were just chatting online like, oh, yeah. Remember that do- dog toy I designed back in 2003? I'm like, oh, yeah, that was a good dog toy. You know, <laughs> the dog toy family's tight knit. Well, you're also the only people that will go to a dog park without a dog. Yeah, you that's... just hang out. Yeah, people look at me a little weird, but... <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, that'll be exciting. Well, I, I'll update you next week on that, but I'm sure it'll be good. Yeah, that's it's been awesome. a bu- It's been a busy week. What about you, James? Have you... Um, well, let's see. I, uh, I just did a a guest, I guess, lecture demo, um, for Reed's sketching class at, um, Parsons. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Did you teach the, your continuous line sketching? No, I actually, um, for this demo, I was mostly talking about the form families. Um, the ones that Reed and I, uh, discussed and right. went through like with the our tecto. watering can mm-hmm. project. So I took this. It's it's a very intense demo because, like, we were taught these form families over the course of many weeks, or like I would say two weeks that were, you know, with Joe Ballet who who developed the form families, um, and uh, but this was all condensed into one class. Um, and it was, how long is the class? Is it two uh, hours? Two. Oh yeah. That's pretty short. It's very short. Um, but, uh, it was a lot of fun. And, um, I know that Reed is going to be reinforcing these, these form families throughout the semester. So it's not like after I'm gone, that's it, you know? Um, and something that I've been interested in kind of doing is, is doing some little tutorials oh. on my page. Yes. I saw, <laughs> I saw your Instagram tutorial your one minute tutorial yeah and it i just got a kick out of it because it's so funny because it was your first one right yes and you had mounted the camera above your sketch but it was so high up that you your head got into the frame my head got in there but you were talking in third person like someone else was sketching <laughs> and you're like james get out of the way james yeah get out. well i, I showed just, check it out because it's hilarious i was just dying laughing. i showed the tutorial i showed the video to you and and we met up with mckay uh mckay nelson right? oh yeah yeah um for lunch really awesome guy check him out on instagram it's mckay dot nelson right on yeah instagram? okay and um he reached out to us and we met up with him and i and i showed it to you to you and mckay and and you guys were both like you need to you need to post this 
but I hadn't added the, added the audio yet. Right. We were, you guys were just like, just post it, whatever. Right. And so I was like, I can't post this and not acknowledge the obvious oh, blooper. Because there would definitely be people commenting, be like, hey, James, you got to move your camera. Your head's in the way. Yeah, exactly. My gigantic head. Um, so, yeah. But I, um, yeah, I thought it would be cool to explore the tutorial space, but do something around these sort of generative processes um so like the foreign fam families are primarily about like generating concepts that you might not normally generate because you're thinking about too far ahead about materials and construction and just right. kind of uh you know I, I thought that was really interesting i thought yeah. you know in your example you had a chair and you sketched it on the side view but then you did a couple different three-dimensional views and the side view was the same for each three-dimensional view, but you changed up the look of the chair for each one. Yeah, um, changed up the construction which materials. Is, which is an interesting way to ideate. I think that was kind of cool. Yeah, so, so yeah, I mean, um, the, but anyway, the, the thing at Reed's, uh, with Reed's sketching class was, uh, was a lot of fun. I didn't say this to the students there, but uh, if any of them are listening, um, Please reach out to me if you have any questions on on anything. And and this is just in general for anybody in the community. I, I enjoy answering questions, especially in regards to, to these forum families and, and these different iterative processes. Um, but yeah, the, you know, um, I guess the, the other thing, I, I would like to tease something. Oh, you're giving me a tease. Okay. And I, and I don't want to go into too much detail about it, but... I do want to say that keep just Eastern Standard, 12 p.m. <laughs> Eastern Standard Time, this coming Tuesday, September 25th, I believe. Okay, so this will be like two days after the pod's released. Yes. Okay. Just keep keep your eyes peeled on Instagram. It's It's going to be a real treat. Are you dropping some heat? Nick, I've showed you what I'm dropping. Some fire? You tell me. Yeah, he's dropping fire. And uh, so, so yeah, that's just, you're forewarned. Yeah, I, I, my jaw was dropped to the floor. <laughs> I am uh, excited for this. I'm excited for you guys to see it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a collaboration. That's, that's the most that I'll say about it, but it's a very exciting collaboration. Um, so, yeah, this Tuesday, September 25th. 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. All right. Watch I, out. I put it on all of my Gmail calendars. I have five of them. <laughs> but um, I don't know. I uh, James, I know you had some, some Apple things you wanted to talk about. Again. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Hector is going to be jumping for joy at this because I, I would like to, I, I would like to, I don't know, make amends. Yeah. With uh, at least with Johnny Ive. Um, and the whole Apple team. Okay. Because I've been thinking about this. I've been mulling over this. You know, I, This is what happened. I know what happened, James. What happened? You were editing the video on YouTube, and you realized how, how uh, crazy you're sounding with the Apple <laughs> stuff. You're critiquing Apple. Yeah. I mean, here's the, here's the thing. My critique comes out of love. It does. You know, you're, you're more critical of the people that you love because you know that they can do better. But, but here's the thing is that I didn't... I didn't quite take into consideration everything that was happening around that announcement. And one of the things that I don't think that I considered with enough weight was the sustainability section. Yeah, I thought that was great. Because... Did we talk about that? We talked about that a little bit. We talked bit, about right? it a little bit, but I think that what, what they're showcasing and what they're moving toward is super exciting because we're seeing a really big corporation... Um, I mean, this corporation is uh, is a trillion dollar corporation. It's it's I mean, it's one of the largest. Um, and to see them approaching what looks like a cradle to cradle type, um, yeah, you know, construction with the new phones and going forward, it looks like you know this might be the most not only the most profitable organization, but the most socially, you know, sustainably responsible corporation. And um, I'm, I'm excited to see now, you know, I, I feel like Apple really got to, got to the answer with a lot of these, 
with a lot of these products that we use from them, you know, there's not much more that you can do with a smartphone. There's not much more you can do with this, like, you know, with the iPad or with the MacBook. But what you can do is refine the construction to yeah. a point where you have ultimate sustainability. And remove that notch, right? And get rid of that notch. That's the most sustainable thing you can do because people are going to be throwing out those phones as soon as they see a notchless iPhone. But um, I think I think it's really really exciting to see to see this company taking up you know this kind of charge and i could see other companies starting to follow suit that you know when i hand back in my iphone like the feeling that all of that material or most of that material is going to go into the next right the next phone is really encouraging and and as a consumer, it makes me feel so much better about purchasing a new phone. Oh, for sure, for sure. And yeah, I, I think uh, Apple's really pioneering this route. I I also I don't know if you watched the keynote or if we meant do we mention it on the last episode? I, I think can't remember. We did and yeah, the keynote. Yeah, and it was like and it was they you know they actually showed an exploded view of the iPhone and like pointed to this battery housing and was like, this battery housing is made of 50% uh, plastic that's made out of corn. Yeah. Um, and they pulled out all of these like very specific and detailed numbers of, you know, the aluminum is, you know, 10% post recycled aluminum and things yeah. like that. I mean, I'm just throwing out numbers there, but I, I really like the detailed breakdown that they gave. Yeah. Because I think the the sustainability talk often has coupled with it this this feeling like you're going to have to compromise right. certain things in order to get the type of product that you would want to design. And I think what Apple is doing is sh- is providing an example of how you can get you know beautifully constructed product as well as sustainability. Right. They're not getting up there and be like, all right, guys iPhone 11 made out of solid cork, <laughs> right? Exactly. Um. So I'm I'm actually very excited because I, I feel like this is the inevitable step. I mean, the tech is only, and the tech and the design of these things is only going to incrementally improve, you know, from announcement to announcement until they get rid of that notch. You know, that's going to be an interesting moment. James is just itching to get that notch. I am, I am. But, you know, I'm excited to see them pursuing this this other route, which is responsible construction. For sure. And, you know, we still need to cover our sustainability episode one day. We'll get there. One day. Maybe we'll just bring on a sustainability expert. Then we don't have to deal with all that, all the hate mail that's going to come in. I think what we should actually do is take prior podcasts and recycle them and, and, and basically pick out words and then realign them to be the sustainability episode. Oh, like literally take out individual words that we say. Yeah, like a soundboard. And construct an entire episode just with our... What if we, instead of recording the podcast, we just recorded all of the words in the dictionary and then we could <laughs> and then we could just like narrate it or write it out i mean my voice right. is is about to run out you know so that would be that would be the responsible thing to do for my vocal cords yeah okay we've we've uh, gone too far off the rails oh gosh um, but um we wanted to get the topic we wanted to get to the topic this week and talk about is design subjective yeah, I think, and I think when I put out the story, my question was, is good design subjective? But, uh, but uh, I don't know. Is there is there a difference between that? I, I think there's maybe some different avenues of this question that we could take. In my head, what I envision is very, when you present to a client and you're showing off a design, say it's, I don't know, a a new iPhone or something, right? Mm -hmm. And you say the curves of this iPhone should be a radius of five millimeters. Right. And your client says, why not six or why not four? Mm -hmm. And is it subjective then? Or is there a reason that it should be exactly five millimeters? I mean, those kind of details, I think when you're, when you're talking about millimeters of a difference, that, I think that is where it perhaps gets subjective, but 
I, I feel like I just recall from school, like when we would be talking about our work and when somebody was maybe reluctant to cr be critical of another, of another person's work or if somebody was defending their work, they might fall back on, well, that's subjective. Mm, like as an excuse. As an excuse. Like I did this because I, I can. Like this is just what I feel. Or that if if somebody didn't understand or didn't like the aesthetic of something, like either a critiquer would be like, you know, well, I'm not going to comment on that because maybe that's subjective or... Right. And I think that I don't, I don't know that I agree with this. I don't know that I agree, especially when it comes to aesthetics, because I feel like, you know, um, I mean, we could also get into functions because, you know, there's an argument to be made that maybe something that might seem like it's not efficiently functional, like which is better. Right. That's interesting, too. Like in terms of usability, is is it a good design to make the product utterly usable? Like, is it like, uh, what's a good example? I'm thinking of like, maybe like on the, uh, like say you have your phone again, right? Right. And you want to reset it. Mm -hmm. You want to upgrade the software. Something's not working right. So you have to press the home button and the side button at the same time. You have to press both of them and hold them down for 10 seconds. That's not the easiest thing to do. I mean, mm -hmm. you're not going to accidentally do that in your pocket. Um, it, it'll take some skill to maneuver your fingers like that. Yeah. And that's maybe not the most usable button, but that is a good design still because the hierarchy of uh, functions values the home button at the top compared yeah. to the reset. The reset's a, a tertiary thing that you're never going to do. Right. I think... I think where where my head is mostly at here is oh, there's a fly in the room, Nick. I cannot believe. Did you just catch that? Oh, Kung Fu Master. No, you didn't. Um, but uh, I I think about it like this. I you know when you're looking through portfolios or you're looking through work, um, you can often you can often stumble upon something and say like, wow, that's excellent without really having a good explanation as to why. Right. You know, it's mostly an aesthetic thing and there's like this feeling of a project being finished and resolved. And there's other projects that you see or other things that you see where, where you're, there's some sort of disconnect. There's some feeling like this isn't fully resolved. Like, there's there's more to figure out here and maybe it functions fine but there's something about the aesthetic yeah that feels unresolved i think a lot of it is to do with composition and balance mm. like uh, literal elements of design that you learn in school you learn what balance composition lighting yeah all, all those features of just design in general it doesn't have to be industrial design you think about graphic design we took uh intro to design class in school and it was literally you just had a piece of paper and you were supposed to draw out oh we're gonna do perspective today mm -hmm. and you just drew perspective and or or we're gonna do balance yeah. take take these uh go outside find three objects and draw them on a page mm -hmm. and i just like found three sticks and and drew them out on a page and the task was to arrange these objects in such a way that it was visually pleasing. Yeah. Um, and there's many different, I guess, techniques to do that. I mean, I think about the golden ratio. Right. I mean, you have the golden rectangle and the golden spiral and things like that. And you have the rule of thirds. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know. I mean, there is definitely some some value to those rules. I'm not exactly a big fan of the golden ratio. I don't know if you are or not. I, I don't use it very often. I mean, uh, for the most part, I'm just like working within the parameters that make sense right. and then just eyeballing it for for a lack of a better word. I also 
Do you ever use the rule of thirds? What is the rule of thirds, Nick? The rule of thirds, I think it... Because uh, I might use it. I just okay. might not call it the rule of thirds. <laughs> well, I think actually everyone... I call it thirdsies. Every, thirdsies. Everyone actually uses it because it's on the iPhone camera. It's the... When you split up right. the camera into thirds. Right. Nine squares. Right. Um, when you crop something. And you're supposed to have the, I guess, strongest elements in those four intersections of right. those lines. Right. Yes, I I guess I do know the rule of thirds because I was a film major before I was an industrial designer. Right, and so you're never supposed to film a subject straight on. However, there are people like Wes Anderson who completely <laughs> defy yeah. that rule. Right, exactly. But he, um, he does it in such a great way that it doesn't even matter. Yeah. Well, it's I guess it's the difference between you know balanced symmetry, which is a lot of what he does, versus the rule of thirds. Mm, right. Um, but... Uh, but yeah, I guess like the thing that I've just been constantly struggling with is like I I do feel and, and I feel like this is kind of maybe an excuse that is made by students for like, you know, um, why they shouldn't change the aesthetic of what they're doing or right. or or whatever, because they're. You know, they're like, that's that's subjective. I understand, and I just don't know how to get... And it's like, you know, we're told, like, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Right. But there are sort of these universally accepted, beautiful objects. How do you do it? How... What is the code to cracking this... The cracking this problem? I don't know, because, I mean, with industrial design, there's more to consider than just the aesthetics... You know, there's the function, and sometimes the fu- function dictates the aesthetics. But, um, but there, there is, there is something. There's, there's some sort of formula, or there's some sort of amount of finessing that needs to be done on something to make it feel like you. You get that feeling of ah, that. That's resolved. I feel the only way I can explain it is that it's an into intuition right when i'm designing i'm placing elements here and there balancing this composition and i have this intuition that just says oh this feels right Right. and i have no other way to explain it except for the fact that hey when i was arranging these elements i arranged them a hundred different ways and uh with my intuition, I felt that this was the best balanced composition. Right. And that's that's a much better way than saying, oh, it's subjective and that's what I wanted. Right. But that's that's kind of how I would talk to that kind of point. Yeah. And I think it takes time. It takes a lot of practice and I guess just working with design and almost art. I almost think it's an artistic. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Because I feel like but there's there's this other there's this other phenomenon which you have design that comes about and i feel like it's kind of universally accepted upon release like there's a feeling like yes this is resolved but then there are things i remember when i saw the the jawbone um jam box for the right. first time and i was like what is this thing like it was good or bad like I didn't know how to feel about it. Hmm. I was like, "This is strange." Like there were there were certain patterns I feel right. like that I felt were strange, but given time, and and that's where this this gets tricky because it's like, is it familiarity with something? Is it something that is hyped where Ooh. you feel like, "Oh, this is good looking because it because everybody is saying that it's good looking." It kind of reminds me of when you listen to an album, a new album for the first time. Right. And it's it sounds like, oh, this is a little weird. Like, it's not exactly what I envisioned. Right. But then you keep listening to it, and eventually you're like, oh, wow. Yeah. This, you you feel all the nuances of it. Right. And you really can admire it from another level. Because there's, like, there's good art, and then there's great art. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. There's, like, art that checks all the boxes, but then there's great art that, like, it makes you sit and stare at it to try to understand it. Right. You know, and I, and I don't know how that seeps into design because there are, there are certain objects that, that upon release, I was like, Oh God, like, what is this? But given time, I start to understand like the notch, 
The notch yeah. on the iPhone. Yeah. <laughs> Given time, it'll, it'll, no. it'll be a great design. We'll, no. We'll be adding notch to our vacuum cleaners, our, our chairs, everything. But I will say that there's, you know, for instance, Karam Rashid. I, like, Karam Rashid, a lot of his... There was a feeling that I had for a while, which was that Karam Rashid literally produces everything that he sketches. And and I kind of... He, he does produce a lot of work. He does p- produce a lot of work. And I, and I almost kind of, like, resented, like, the work that was coming out because I was like, why, why does this need to Karim be Karim Rashid is the Drake of industrial design. <laughs> but I love Drake. But he, no, no, no. But here's the thing is that given time and also given that I've, you know, I've started to, like, you know, build my home and put put objects within it. Mm-hmm. I've realized, like, I've kind of turned a corner with Karim where I'm like, there's a reason why his objects are the way that they are. And and maybe each individual object doesn't feel that special in the grand scheme of things. But you don't want objects that call too much attention to himself. I mean, I know that he's very bold with his color choice. Right. But I would say that the objects themselves don't feel completely resolved in and of themselves. But he's essentially providing props for interior design. And so his pieces are part of a larger composition, which is the interior. Interesting. So you're you're thinking that Karim Rashid's chairs, for example, are unfinished until they're in a room and right. being used. Absolutely. I almost I almost feel like that's every design, right? Is it unfinished until someone uses it? I th- I think to some degree. I mean, I mean, we you know we. Um, I always I always thought you're never a designer until you ship something. Yeah. Like you're never a designer unless someone's using your product. Yeah, but it's you know we do, we do often in our concepts and in our renderings we put we put things in context. I mean, the iPhone is a weird thing because the context is your hand and your pocket. Right. You know, so it's not like an embellishment to a room. I almost think that it's. I don't think the iPhone. I feel like it's the other way around. Like, the, the apps. Right. Your the the apps is what you're using, and the context is the phone. Oh, wow. Yeah. That, <laughs> that is profound. <laughs> yeah, because because nowadays, I mean, what are we gonna do? drool over a fillet i mean that's what we'll do so you're saying that the iphone is the room and the apps are the interior exactly exactly that's cool Mm -hmm. i mean because that's essentially what it is in vr i mean you know the vr device transports you into the room and then the applications that you use are the room exactly exactly that's that's really interesting but yeah i um i don't know nick i i don't have an answer to the subjective this is like thing. this is something that you could it, it's unpack very, yeah, it's, over many many episodes. It's very ambiguous, and I think it is that it's that golden ticket to design. Honestly, because if you can nail this part of design of you know the feeling of an object, being able to subconsciously or intuitively create this beautiful form, you know this resolved form, I think that's what makes a great designer. Because a lot of designers can just fill the the problems of the the design brief you know mm-hmm. you can come up with a solution to check all the boxes off um but you know what what makes you that great designer is that extra intuitive subjective ambiguous part of design that is so hard to explain because it's i think an art form to some degree yeah and one other thing that I'll that I'll touch on before we close this 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 subject is, I think that somebody might argue that good design is something that um, eliminates like a certain kind of struggle or that makes something more efficient or you know th- that good design is there so that um, things are more productive and more efficient within our lives. And to that, I would counter a lot of the things that we see in in rituals like coffee, like the French press. The French press continues to persist within the modern era. It's it's not efficient. Right. It's 
like in terms of making coffee or cleaning up afterward. But yeah, you should just you should just go tell those people to use their Keurig and get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> but there's something to the whole to the whole process and the ritual of it that does make it a really enjoyable design. And it's like it's something that I noticed about um Nespresso is a lot of their machines even though everything is sort of automated, there's one really large sort of interaction the lever, that you have to right? have with it. Yeah. Yeah, which is like this lever, mm -hmm. which I think was a brilliant move on their part because, you know, with with the French press you have the plunge, which right. is super satisfying. And for them to add that in, I mean, that was a great insight, I think. I think, yeah, I could agree with that for sure. I mean, I think about some of the other, I guess, automated coffee things I think of. I mean, just a normal coffee maker, you just press a button. Right. But the lever, that interaction, it's yeah. a, beautiful, a beautiful thing. Yeah. But, yeah, I, I, I feel like good good design, you can kind of measure it on all, like, on an interaction level, on a functional level, on an aesthetic level. I, I think here's here's my closing mark. I would okay. say I would say that is good design subjective. I would I I don't think that's the right question. I think the statement should be good design is intuitive in a way, not intuitive intuition. Uh, maybe I don't know. I don't have a closing remark. Good. So <laughs> you, well, but I think I understand what you're saying. Right. You're saying you can intuit what is good design. Yeah, I can look at something and be like, oh, that's beautiful. Hmm. I don't know. Yeah. I it's, don't know. This one's a hard one. Yeah. It, I am, it doesn't have a, a clean answer, it I'm doesn't. afraid. Um, but yeah, we got, uh, we did get one comment uh, about the topic because cause I um, was asking for comments or questions. And Derek Elliott, um, who I collaborated with on uh, the helicopter animation, uh, he said... Uh, when the goals and parameters of a design problem are clearly stated, a design can be non-subjectively assessed by how well the goals are met and the parameters are adhered to. Right. I mean, I think that's kind of what I was saying earlier. It's like, yeah, a lot of designers can check the box. Right. Of, are these goals met? Check, check, check. Yeah. But I think that one last piece that, takes you from a good designer to a great designer right is that intuitiveness to know how to balance the form and understand the art form of design itself right i i mean i've sort of been obsessing over the the brerlich brothers book that i got they do it in an that's a, a great example of because they how they do it. you know they they obviously their their designs function right but they take it to another level they they push it beyond just all those boxes being checked and it's like it's like the most romantic design i've ever seen for sure for sure um, yeah it's breathtaking yeah check out the brulex if you haven't yeah they're they're an incredible design duo they're brothers um they're french just like they're daft french oh i love daft punk they're not brothers but they are french yeah <laughs> Oh, man, maybe we should get some questions, actually get some answers out here. Yes, let's do it. On the table. Uh, we had a lot of questions come in. I appreciate everyone sending in questions. If you have questions, feel free to send them in to myrndetailspodcast at gmail.com. Uh, we try to answer them all, but sometimes our inbox gets full and we just have to pick our favorites. And this week we had some great questions coming in. Uh, the first one comes from Claudia, and they are at Klausis on Instagram. And mm -hmm. she asks, how do you properly credit your team members on a group project? Do you link their websites? Do you just write in their names? What do you do? And, you know, I assume this is more geared toward uh, school projects, um, but also it could be industry projects as well. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to properly credit your team members? I mean, I think I think the problem here is, especially when you graduate school and you have your portfolio of hey, I was on this team with five other designers and you show all these sketches and models in the final render, the employer is like, what exactly did you do specifically? Yeah. Well, one thing is, and I remember this from school when we were in portfolio class, um, something that has stuck with me was 
don't put any sketches in your portfolio that are not your sketches. Okay. Because because sketches are a very personal thing. Like that is like a a skill that is personal to the designer. That's true. If I would look through a portfolio and I saw sketches, I would assume that it's yours. Yeah. Um, but what about renders? Renders or three D modeling? Okay. Because that's a that's a pretty important skill. And if an employer sees a hot render or a hot three D model, but you didn't do it, you weren't right. part of that part of the process in that. That that's a bit tricky. I think you should define define the role that you that you uh, occupied within the group. Um, but I think that I think the final product is is presentable by everyone. I mean, the person who did the rendering should call out in their within their portfolio that their role was the rendering right but i feel like the model itself i mean probably there was there were multiple people that had input into the final design yeah yeah for sure and how that came to be you know but um i mean i think at baseline you definitely need to credit your team members if you have a team project but that, he, <laughs> that's the first thing to do right, right. But here's the thing. Uh-oh. You cannot pull the wool over your uh, employer's eyes because they will look at your other projects and find out where your strengths are. Oh, yeah. You're never going to trick someone. You're never going to trick somebody. Yeah. So if you use a rendering that, you know, was uh, created by somebody for the group project, I mean, I, I do think that that's up for grabs because... It showcases the final design. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think I would agree with that. But you're not going to convince anybody unless you show those chops elsewhere in your portfolio that that you have those skills. Right. Yeah. If your portfolio is all filled with team projects, and and you can't really define what part you did, I mean, that's not good. That's not a good sign. Yeah. You have point. to. You have to showcase what it is that you are capable of doing. Do you link their websites or no? Do you link your team members' websites? Well, I know on Behance, it has like the collaborative function. Yeah. Which I think is really great. Because that, when you do that, then the employer can go and click on each team member and be able to see the skill sets that they attributed to. One thing that I love about the um, industrial design firm Minimal in Chicago is Every single they post every single one of their projects on Behance, and they they have every person who worked on the project connected to that project. You know they right. they have it as a collaborative project. Right. And you know like Scott Wilson is in all of them. Right. For the most part. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But it also has all the other individual team members, and I think that's awesome. I think that like a firm like that recognizing like. You know, minimal is not called Scott Wilson Studios. It's called minimal, and and it's great that he is spreading the wealth. Of course, you know? of course, for sure. Um. So yeah, I I think that, I mean, I don't think anybody would be like, oh, what is this person doing, linking all these other people? Like, yeah, I, I think that that's it's that's perfectly, like it's perfectly acceptable. A great kindness that you do to your other team members. And I think for those, I think Klausus was maybe concerned about other people not crediting her in mm-hmm. their portfolio. And oh. I, and I'll, I'll just say that, you know, you don't have to worry about them. Again, they're going to hit the roadblock of if they ever get hired, the employees can be like, hey, do that sexy render that you showed in your portfolio. And then they're going to be like, oh, crap. I can't <laughs> um, but so I, I really wouldn't really stress about it. But, yeah, I would definitely say credit your team members. Say what you did specifically. I like the the idea of only show your sketches no matter what, but I think it's okay to show the final render and just credit it, said, saying that your team did it or you didn't. I mean, you put input into the design, but it was a team project. Right. I I have to interject here because um, Claudia's uh, handle has reminded me of something. Some, What's that? Some cocktail party trivia. Okay. Uh, for those listeners out there. 
Um, I'm currently the only person drinking on this podcast because Nick says he's getting sick, quote unquote. But um, so uh, I'm going to run off the rails for a second. Okay. Something I learned when I was traveling through Italy. Do you know you know what the Colosseum's original name was? Klausus. No. That would have been good. I mean, what that was? Like, what was it? It was the Flavian Amphitheater. Oh, okay. Because what does Flavian mean? Uh, I think they were the patrons of the of the the stadium, basically. Okay. But the reason that it's called the Colosseum is because there was a giant colossus, like you know, size statue out in front of it, and so it essentially got nicknamed the Colosseum. Got it. Got it. Um, okay. So yeah, just a little trivia. Fun facts. Fun facts for we're your next tri- trivia night. We're here sweating the small stuff, <laughs> laying out the fun facts. Oh man. Oh man. Um, yeah, thanks for sending that in, Claudia. Yes, thank you. And we had an, another question come in from Jordan Nall, and he is at Nall.Jordan. Also, shout out to Jordan. He's a Patreon member. Oh, he's yeah. a patron. 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 Um, and he asks, why do you guys think ID as a career isn't very well known? Mm. And do you think it's better for ID to be less known? He says that he hears from sources, Google, lol, that I, I'm just reading. I'm just reading. Just like, reading yeah, word yeah. for word. He says from sources that the ID job market is already pretty saturated. Um, and he wants to know our thoughts. Yeah, I uh, I think it is some sort of conspiracy amongst industri- industrial designers to keep the pool small. <laughs> don't tell anyone. No, we found the perfect job. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I don't. I don't know why. I mean, I did find out in high school, but I think. I think my mom actually figured, or no, my dad, because my dad is an engineer and he's worked with industrial designers. So he knew the career, but for the normal person who's like, how do I put all these skills together? I mean, you kind of talked about this yeah, um, in your talk last night at Apple. I don't really, again, it was kind of an accident. You know, I just yeah. discovered it searching for majors in colleges. It's so wild to me because it seems like Henry uh, Henry Dreyfus, right? Richard Dreyfus. Wait, I don't even know what you're what, talking about. <laughs> not Dreyfus. What's the who's the really infamous like 1920s, 1930s industrial designer? Oh, Raymond Lowy. I he mean, he's not 1920s. Oh my he's God, like, Dreyfus. Did, where did Dreyfus? I mean, from? Raymond Lowy. He, I mean, I have his book right here. I haven't read it yet, but well, okay. <laughs> What, I don't know where I got Dreyfus, okay. but Raymond Lowy. Yes. He, he's, <laughs> he's quoted as, or he's coined as the father of industrial design. He seems like he was like the cat's pajamas. Like people knew who Raymond Lowy was. Yeah. Like he was, he was like high society, highfalutin. You also knew what the Eames were. The Eames yeah. came at that time too. How how is it that we don't really know about industrial design when we have like these super famous and well known predecessors? I don't know. I think because like Europeans, if you meet Europeans, like you tell them what you do, they immediately know what you do, even when they're not industrial designers. Like they know the field. But in America, which is so weird because we're a, like a like an outwardly capitalist consumerist culture like how do we not know i think it's part of the uh the like self-actualization pyramid i still think that europe has had a a lot more time to reach that pinnacle of hey i want to live the best life as i can and you know they've just built their society up so far that to live the best life that you can is just to have this very nice simple like life and have everything curated in your right. life like and have wonderfully designed objects in your household whereas in america it's i think we're still on like second tier to, to the top it's like oh yeah let's just buy everything we can and as much as we can just try to figure out what we're trying to do we're we're definitely well we've just hit mid-century again what mid-century modern yeah mid-century modern. what as a trend yeah oh gosh i mean not that just tr- that but trend it's, but it's back in the mid-century yeah, but it's <laughs> Ha. We've talked but, about this. Before. No, I, I, I imagine this case where like the 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 pilgrims when they were leaving, like there was an industrial designer that was supposed to be on board, but he <laughs> but he overslept. 
Because <laughs> he had a he had a big project the night. Yeah, before. he had like a huge deadline the night before, and he like totally overslept <laughs> and oh, missed that's a good one. Missed the Mayflower. That is a good one. I like that, James. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I I I do feel like there's a part of it where like we are a little just like this little collective. But I don't know. Is there? I, I wonder if it's more well known in like the Midwest, which is like traditionally a manufacturing hub. I would say lesser. Really? Yeah. I would say your your New Yorks, your San Francisco's, you're more apt to find someone who knows what industrial design is. I mean, people have to wonder who Johnny Ive is. Like, you know, I is he's I would the, love he's to the know. British guy. I would love to know like how common knowledge like Jonathan Ive is in America. Yeah, it's hard to pull myself back out of design and really see it with a, a new lens because we're so in, ingrained into it now. Yeah, but here's the thing, Jordan. Don't tell anybody about industrial design. If I hear that you're telling <laughs> high school kids about what industrial design is, I will hunt you down. Yeah, I don't know how Chris Ferentz figured it out. I don't know. He, uh, I'm scared. I'm worried because oh, Chris Ferentz is on board. He's probably telling all of his high school buds like, the, it's all over for us. It's all over. We're gonna get. We're gonna get. The cat's over, out of the bag. We're gonna get overtaken by these young, and young you, hot, hot shots. Too. Have you ever tried to get a cat back into a bag? It's nearly <laughs> impossible. Oh man, it's out of there. Thanks for sending that in, Jordan. Thank you. We but, have. We have time for one more, James. Shh, don't tell anybody. Uh, yeah, I think we have time for one more. Okay. Is it clear that I'm more intoxicated than you are during this episode? Uh, I don't know. How much have you drinking? Uh, maybe three, three uh, tiny cups. Oh no, those are pint glasses. What? Oh, dear. Oh, boy. Oh, no. What's this funnel? I've been drinking out of this, too. <laughs> That's a hamster hamster funnel. <laughs> James, what are you doing? For hydration. All right. Yeah, I'll let you read this one. Okay. Uh, Brad uh, State, S-T-A-I-T, and, and at S-T-A-I-T-E-B uh, for the uh, handle is it more important to showcase your individual style solving an issue you are familiar with first hand or should you try to work on the skill of solving an issue for others? This is an interesting one because I also see this as a, when you're in school, do you design to create your own brand or you design to just create a cool object or do you pick a brand say, hey, I'm going to do Porsche and I'm going to design a toaster for Porsche. Yeah. I don't think any either one of these is right or wrong, but I will say this. I've I've sort of been thinking about about this a lot in in terms of design education. And I think when you're first starting out, it makes sense to focus the projects on yourself. Like how would you design your life to be the best life it could be? I think that's the easy get for sure. And, and in the beginning, I think I agree. You should go for that because yeah. it's it's right there in front of you. Because I think that in order to develop the skill to be empathetic to others and to design for them, you have to first empathize with yourself and design for yourself. Have you ever designed an object that was so beyond what what you could empathize with? Um, like something that you would have never used or had will never use again. I mean, I, I think back to a project that I did in school with Reed and uh, my friend Oscar Salguero, which was a shoe for, for Haitian right. children. Mm -hmm. um, and there was, I mean, there was like a, a bit of disconnect for like, we don't know what these people are going through. And, and we can kind of guess how how we might want to style this shoe based on clues that we can pick up and people i mean we interviewed um students that were from haiti to try and get a glimpse into the culture um but i i mean i almost feel like there's on, only so far you can go with that kind of project before you need to bring in somebody from that culture to to have them like have some ownership over it yeah in order for it to be like if we were to take that project to the haitian people as like a couple kids from the united states like for them to feel ownership over it i, I feel like we would have to access people within that culture yeah for sure 
Um, That's interesting. But, um, you know, I, I think, yeah, I mean, I, I think I had a project where I did the, the training tool for dogs. Right. Like this training device that Brandon was. Brandon McMillan, yeah. a lucky dog. Yeah, James is a big fan. Every Saturday <laughs> on CBS Dream Team. Oh, boy. You don't understand how much my wife and I love. James has cable. Brandon McMillan James and has lucky cable. dog. It's so good. It's such a feel good show. It's good. It's good. I I met the guy, so I feel like the magic's not there for me. I'm sure that you watch the show. Why and is it's the magic? What are you saying about Brandon? Well, McMillan? when he when he says that your your train device isn't correct or is it not is it's not the right uh, color. It's, Nick, Nick, listen to, to the expert. Okay, okay? the expert was saying that we should make it bright red, like fire truck red, and I was like, that's a polarizing color. People are gonna not buy this because it's uh, obtrusive and hideous. And he was like, oh. Well, what do you think? I was like, let's make it a light blue. But and we fought back and forth on it for like a good. Why month. was why did he want to make it red? Because he just liked red. Going that, back to the, that going was back purely to... the the answer that he gave you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, cause... you asked him point blank why red, and he said because I like red. Yeah, there wasn't any sort of reason for like no. dogs responding to certain colors. No, he he he's not a designer for one right and obviously color is a very subjective thing kind of going back to our our topic like when you dive into color that's almost to the the subjective degree where you can't really justify it nick i hate to burst your bubble but working in kitchenwares for three years i'll have you know that the top selling colors are black and red okay well that's kitchenware The top selling colors and training tools oh, no. are black and blue. But anyway, um... but yeah, that was that was interesting. Just because it's a device that I would never use, because um, I'm not a professional dog trainer, right? Um, and it would take a lot of time to learn how to professionally train dogs. So I really mm-hmm. did have to understand his needs and his wants, um, even though he wanted to make it red. But I didn't, and we made it blue, thankfully, because <laughs> it would have been horrible if it was red. Fair enough. It's a great sign. I'm actually proud of it. Is that subjective? If it was red, I wouldn't be proud of it. Is that subjective, Nick? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anymore. Oh, no. Oh, man. So, yeah, I I think I like your idea of doing your first few projects being your individual style, kind of figuring out, you know, something around, around your life that you can solve. Yeah. And then venturing off into the more difficult projects well here's here's the other thing is like i don't know that you necessarily need to pursue an individual style because i think your individual style will will always come through oh yeah that's a i mean that's a whole nother topic really but a lot of people wonder where do they get style from and it is something that just naturally comes i mean i think in a way you can pick and choose what you like and i think just subconsciously you reiterate that into your style yeah i think so um i don't i think it will always come through i think um as much as you might try to fight it i I actually think it's harder to just like straight up copy somebody because like you really have to get into their head space in order to do that or to like legitimately verbatim copy a design right in order to copy somebody because i think it's almost nearly impossible like you just you'd have to go about it so mindfully like copying somebody i i just think that as you develop your individual style develops it's just like unavoidable yeah yeah i wouldn't stress about it i think yeah just take it naturally yeah um thanks for sending in brad and of course every week we like to give a shout out and james on this guy this this week actually it's a it's entire firm i believe right yeah and i don't know that they really need shouting out i mean uh the firm is bkid and their um instagram is at bkid.co and i feel like you can find their their products and and I can't really figure out whether they're all conceptual or some of them are real and physical, but we've all pinned their stuff I'm to Pinterest. our inspiration <laughs> boards. Yeah, absolutely. No, I've definitely seen a lot of their, their work on Behance as well. Yeah. And I believe they're in South Korea. Yes. And yeah, it is interesting. I, you just showed me the project with the mouse. Oh. It's a conceptual computer mouse. It's so good. And... 
the idea is is that you're working for eight hours a day, and at the end, at you know five o'clock, the mouse decides to not work anymore and run away from you. Yeah, it turns into like this literal mouse. Yeah, it turns from a computer mouse to a real mouse, not a real mouse, a robot mouse. Right, and just scurries away. It's beautiful, and and I think it's like. And this is another topic that I think we can talk about someday is like the legitimacy of, of kitsch design, because I think it's a very polarizing topic. But I think like if this were a real thing, like, first of all, I think it's very beautifully designed the way that they depicted it. But I also think that there's like, I don't know, there there's a delightful interaction there. And like, I can't imagine that actually happening. Because I think I would get so frustrated <laughs> that I'd probably smash the mouse. Yeah, think about your deadline being at five. And you have to finish because you your mouse is going to yeah. run away. But it's like, it, it kind of, like things like this almost open up a whole new field. I mean, not a whole new field, but this field of like just purely conceptual design. Because there's it's, something so satisfying about like just watching this video explaining the product. Yeah, it's an art form for sure. I think... I mean, I love doing conceptual products. Yeah. Like the fat strap chair. I mean, that's conceptual to a degree. Right. I mean, it's a real chair, but... But it's like taking the conceptual and integrating it into like a storytelling and film process. Yeah, like the video specifically is really, really beautifully done. Yeah. Um, so yeah, big shout out to uh, BKID. Um, check them out. I'm sure you have already, but maybe you just don't know it. And uh, check out the... Uh, the conceptual work on Behance. Yeah. It's really nice. Great stuff. Um, and yeah, thank, thanks everyone for listening. Of course, our intro and outro is by Kiyoshi the Kid. And uh, feel free to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play. Gotta watch that YouTube. Get on that YouTube. Give us that thumbs up. Yeah. Like and subscribe. Um, and, uh, you know, James has been doing a lot of editing. There's a lot of minor details or no micro details yes where you where you cut out each question right yeah i cut out each question i also have them in a playlist like in, so you can you can just click play and hear all of those answers yeah so if you want those quick and quick and dirty uh insights and also the major details after the pods i've been posting yeah we got major and micro on youtube yeah major micro minor right all of them are there sweating the sweating the small stuff sweating that small stuff um all right guys uh i'm at nick p baker and i am at i draw on receipts peace out later